Hi guys, welcome to the Island Renaissance podcast hosted by yours truly Suresh De Silva. And today we have a fantastic guest who really needs no introduction, but just in case you've been living under a rock or you've been sort of drowned in the sea somewhere in the ocean depths, this is Shanuki De Alves. She is a reputed icon when it comes to marketing, communications, PR, branding. Uh, she's also legendary when it comes to uh, theater. She started acting when she was four years old. She's played more than 20 leads. She's also an assistant art director, artistic director. She's also a director of choreography. She's a keynote and motivational speaker. She is heavily involved and immersed in animal welfare projects. That's another thing we sort of share in common. I mean, the fact that we love animals, cats and dogs. We'll elaborate more on that later. Uh, she dons a lot of different hats and uh, a lot of different garb, as it were. So, uh, Shanuki, thank you for joining oh, me. introduction. Well, you've done the reading. <laughs> done the reading, yeah. Huh? done the reading. I thought... <laughs> so, you're very good. I thought might as well Super. do it properly. I feel so good about myself now. <laughs> I'm glad that you do. So, thanks for being here. So, what's what's new? Um, what, <laughs> that, that's such a like off the left field question. What is new? Uh, what is the latest in Shanuki's yeah. realm and Shanuki's uh, realm of dungeon and dungeons, dungeons and dragons? <laughs> um, the dungeon is still there. The dragons are also still there. Um, so what's the latest? I am less involved in the arts now. And I am more involved in, I guess, social work and social causes. That's become my thing now. Less involved in the branding, more involved in social communications. All right. Um, and yeah, and and I'm very loud <laughs> on social media with my political views a lot. Again, which is like, why we get along. Yeah. Well, I think yes, yes, I think you're yes. maybe a little bit more. You lean a bit more heavily towards the political stuff, but I think yeah, I, I. I mean, I share. You know, I, it's like that whole. The the naggy social justice warrior social justice warrior aunties that like nobody wants to hear on Twitter that's that's me <laughs> yeah but I think it uh, it's important because you don't do it I find just for the sake of advocating and supporting a cause I I find that extremely annoying I see a lot of people doing that uh, the social justice warriors mm. because it's either something that's trendy. Or it's something that yeah. they take on because it will help them to sort of generate more likes and followers. Like I can sincerely say that the time that I've known you, that you don't care about any of that stuff. It's not really noise. I think you're just cutting through a lot of the noise that's there. I think I'm just more a little bit more involved in the sources uh, of you know where it's all happening, and I'm I'm more involved in sort of that world of the policy makings and the the lobbying and stuff. So, in that sense, what I do put out there, which are primarily personal opinions, but they're based on sort of information that I have access to. Right. But if I was to just say like yes, the the social justice warrior thing online mm. yeah it's a trend definitely it's a fad and sometimes they're so misinformed uh, it's true and it gets a little annoying when they're like really defensive about their views but they don't even know where it's coming from Correct. but I think that stems from the fact that everybody needs to belong you know everyone wants to feel validated everyone wants to feel like they're part of something so when when these young kids especially, they cotton on to some piece of information that they've seen that, you know, they resonate with. Then they'll use that as their, you know, primary whatever petition tool online and they'll fight for it. They don't do the reading. They don't do the yeah. background. They're not educated on the history of what and where and how. But that's dangerous. Isn't and it? they're not practicing any critical thinking. That's where it gets, there you go. so, goes wrong. So now you, yeah. I think, touched upon something extremely valid. What I find is, I am this in my personal view right like people when they lack emotional intelligence mm -hmm. they lack 
critical thinking and they lack holistic experience of like you said having either empirical research done or having yeah. proper life experiences that yeah. have informed yeah. their opinions and their views on these things it becomes something uh completely different like even recently on twitter uh remember there was this thing that we both agreed on where uh we we agree on quite a lot i think we agree on more things than more we disagree things. yeah even yeah. if i disagree then I'll, for once i'll keep him quiet because you know i like suresh i know suresh so i won't get into it on a public space with suresh you heard it first <laughs> on the island renaissance podcast <laughs> so like that i don't know whether that's a qualification or disqualification for me i like suresh once like, ooh, this episode is out we will find out all the mobs will, turn <laughs> we will all the mobs will turn out then up uh no Oh, we find this thing where yeah like people are like you know sort of castigating and like there are actual there's actual like like people hunting after each other in terms of attacking people yeah. online and there, there's a lot of uh, chastisement that's yeah. going on this there's a lot of cancel culture is like really toxic it honestly. is isn't it yeah because they i think they're just going to end up canceling themselves at one point and they do I I think in a way like when it's it's that's why I said that I started off with that people really want to feel like they belong to a thought process they they're validated when they feel like you know they have other peers you know that that whole group think thing right. so they'll latch on to this cancel culture because it's popular you know it's like the concept of bullies the school bullies right yeah. you have people Where who they'll latch on, on and they'll latch on and they'll cancel each other and suddenly it becomes really cool to you know talk down to somebody and just mm. mock and criticize and all of that uh, but eventually what happens is when the rest of the social media space is also watching that behavior it becomes very ugly to see mm. you know at the way people go about it it's not informed discourse it's not respectful disagreements you can agree to disagree that's true it's not arguments that are sort of based on fact and evidence it's just this whole mockery name calling personal insults you go into a different realm but as you said they end up canceling themselves because sometimes either they get twisted up in their own arguments that kohe de anne malle bolle and they make an idiot of themselves anyway or people around them who are watching these conversations start to drift away because you don't drift want away. to you don't want to engage with an individual who's going to be that nasty that's right you know so uh, eventually i guess i hope it's a learning and growth phase for this kind of person online where they realize the folly of their ways and they change tact <laughs> on how they engage the problem yeah. i think though is that social media and the advent of technology i think these are great things they're fantastic things if we kind of wield these tools mm. like in a sort of resourceful and a sort of proactive but accountable and diligent and responsible yeah. way but like you said there are so many who are living lives living their lives like vicariously through social media that they don't have any accountability so like you said accountability that's the word they're just attacking and yeah. chasing after yeah. people and mocking them and rebuking and like 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 you said it comes to the point where they start to actually uh insult and assault people's yeah. identities yeah. Uh, their families their person and what a lot of people don't know suresh is this is a crime this is actually a legal crime it's online violence it's online it's it's cyberbullying or whether it's online gender based violence whether it's uh, disinformation spreading disinformation and misinformation it is actually criminal but young people people on social media in sri lanka a lot of them don't know mm. the right their rights to protect themselves from it or they That's don't true. know the laws to prevent themselves from doing it That's right? right so because of that this continues and yeah no accountability is implemented because nobody is really fighting for it and the minute mm. you call it out and if you're of the age that I am you're Karen <laughs> and Karen is a name that I'm becoming very familiar with these days <laughs> yeah i i feel that what's happening with a lot of see so that's that's their go to when they really have nothing else to sort of say yeah they have nothing of like substance to like they just want to feel like they're part of something 
But and they feel very good. It, bullying gives you a high. It's a power. It's it's a. It's, but it's, but even parasites want to feel like they're part of something. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily but, mean. But but that's the psychology, right? We are all humans, and we have this thing of when we it becomes almost an addiction to because herd mentality, right? Herd mentality, and you become popular for certain toxic uh, narratives that you start spreading. That's true, but the fact that they can't differentiate between whether it's a toxic narrative that they're defending with their whole heart and soul and lives. But it's funny, like most of them have barely lived their lives. No. They <laughs> yeah. they they're living I'm not I mean it's not in Sri Lanka kids don't live in basements. Yeah. But as 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 the sort of the western uh ethos sort of propagates and says, you know, trolls like a lot of these people who shout and scream finally yeah. are just living with their parents. Yeah. They don't know what it is to live independently. They don't know what it is to like do a job, to like work, to have to I bet you that most of them don't know how to pay utilities. Or don't ever have to call for the island rent. renaissance. This is the ageist podcast. The now. ageist. The ageist. This, <laughs> this is the is ageist the episode. The uncle take down the so, young ones. So we are so so and yes, this is this is the <laughs> uncle ageist and this is Auntie Karen on, <laughs> on the island renaissance podcast. Yeah, I can just see. Maybe yeah. what I should do is for every episode to bring one of the ISTs. So this is the ageist one, and then yeah. we'll move to. But it's not. It's not just. I know that the theme of this conversation has now ventured into this space already. But it's also not. Yeah, the conversation has gone very dark yeah, yeah, right from the get go. This culture, this mm. this pervasive negative culture that's on social media, uh, it's a. It's not a behavior that's singularly like attributed to young people alone there are correct, like, correct. there Absolutely. are older people there are also paid for sure. trolls for sure there for are sure. politically instigated people yeah, creating yeah, yeah. this no absolutely yeah. absolutely you keep everybody in a state of confusion and misinformation they're easily influenced because it's it's the whole propaganda approach it's pretty yeah. convenient right if you divide create divide and conquer divide yeah. polarize if you create enough confusion and people are perplexed and they start basically hawking and attacking each other the focus diverts away yeah. from the actual topics and themes in hand right yeah. so to answer your very first question what's new is that chanuki is also working a lot professionally in social cohesion uh, on on developing and uh, sort of trying to improve social cohesion especially are, are you, in online spaces sorry are you are you working on developing social media policies with regards to um, the uh, regulatory frameworks <clears throat> yes Yes and no. Okay, I'm I'm involved in advocacy, more advocacy uh, for social cohesion, both offline and online. So that involves the whole peace building and reconciliation efforts in the country when it comes to you know post conflict work. Right. But I'm also working on several. I consult on different projects that are specifically about online violence mm. and about informing policy reform uh, for the kind of laws. strengthening of uh, laws that we need to address online violence issues and sort of the online social cohesion issues so i i was in the last few years i've been trained on it i work in different project teams on it i work with different organizations and groups that are working on it as a consultant and yeah so that's what's new <laughs> No, oh, but that's awesome. That's that's <laughs> still quite a lot. It doesn't mean that the rest of the stuff that i introduced the with is uh, irrelevant i mean a lot of that is still there of yeah, course yeah it's not all artsy fartsy in shanuki's world anymore <laughs> it, it's it's not just artsy yeah, fartsy yeah. yeah yeah but okay so let's uh, lighten up the mood a little bit <laughs> do you remember the first time we met yes so this was in 2013 the first time you met me yes yeah okay no. like so no so we knew of each other you've been on the media like for yeah, yeah, yeah. donkeys so, years so, so right you, so we like, yeah. so correct so we knew of each other for yes. the longest time yes. but we officially met uh as part of the workshop players when the Jesus, work, Christ. Jesus Christ Jesus Christ superstar Christ. and finally we are actually recording years, huh? we're recording this podcast on good friday which is what the whole thing was set on whole like, thing was set on yeah. and I was thinking about this this morning. It's been a decade since that was staged, and uh, the workshop players got the rights from Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber yeah. and Tim Rice, and we staged it here. And that was of that scale. That was mm. my first experience 
being Big involved with the theater. theater. Yeah, the, like the whole yeah. gamut of it, everything from the rehearsals to what have you. But that's where we met. But do you remember the first time we had a conversation properly? I mean, we we were rehearsing and we were no, meeting I'll, at rehearsals. I'll be very honest. I have goldfish memory, and I'm going to say I'm old enough to claim that without shame. But uh, no, I can't remember the first conversation. But I do remember I I had preconceived notions about who you were, as do many people who see sort of that facade you put on on media, right? It's not a facade entirely. No, I think it is because now I know you better, <laughs> right? Now I know you better. But that whole mean, in, intimidating. grouchy whatever thing that you put on the the dark you know like i'm i'm a, a follower of satan kind of whatever things y'all used to she put means out. the cookie monster the cookie <laughs> yeah. monster so um so that was a perception and i actually was not in the country when the auditions took place oh, right, right okay so i i was not able to attend the auditions so then i heard about it from suran like okay we cast our Judas Suresh de Silva and of course we were looking for rockers we were looking for the vocal rangers the sort of charisma so we all knew and we knew that Jerome was like madly in love with you at that point like you were right for the role when i heard about it but then it was always this whole thing of oh god now this rock star mentality is going to walk into the workshop place and all you right know, like that you, you know it's it's you, you're going to get the dark death metal rock god walking into a room full of musical artists <laughs> so there was a perception all right but yeah that that kind of obviously <laughs> washed away pretty so damaged so, heavily so we, we met at uh, jazz house where he was showing us previous uh, renditions of jesus christ superstar and mario oh. and you turned up for that we didn't really talk He was oh, showing right, us. Right, okay. He was showing us yeah, like yeah. the recent uh, stuff that had uh, yeah. yes. sort of been yes, staged, yes. right? To give us tips of like the different yeah. versions of the production and sort of the choreography and like all of that, right? The singing styles and acting. But the first time we spoke was now the re- pe- people don't understand like how intense it is, right? Like you've done theater your whole life, yeah. Like so, me being in like a rock metal band, that scene, it's. pretty grueling but it's not as intense not even close like we rehearse we play yeah. shows if you get tours we tour that part of it is so there. this is like the the equivalent of a rugby player going in for a ballet <laughs> rehearsal and saying i didn't know how hard it was exactly right? it's something like that yeah. so not only is it extremely taxing on your physical being like you have to be incredibly fit mm. but you have to be incredibly like emotionally and psychologically aligned as well because and you cannot be hung over when you, you walk into you, a rehearsal you cannot be you cannot be hung over so this <laughs> this, this, this is all this the all this all new things right <laughs> so f- for and like we have so many rehearsals you have the singing rehearsals yeah. and then you have like the sort of the dance acting choreography dance choreography acting. and then you have like sort of the acting rehearsals and then it gets more intense as it gradually goes along so for some reason we couldn't get the lionel went maybe because there was a production going and we moved to that hall in like rajagiri what's it Devi called hall. that yeah. that hall which yeah. name that name i can that, never that remember that had a lot of different names different yeah. names <laughs> and we used to uh go for lunch we went to we used to walk to the pereran sans there uh, pereran sans and we used to go to the big bite biryani big bite biryani yeah. right so this particular day we were at pereran sans and i remember we were seated there and for some reason i can't say unbeknownst because there was a problem with the props and they need you guys needed props and then somehow it came to suresh has vlogs at home and then oh, i can't remember but this must have been an excellent so this conversation, conversation happened <laughs> right. where without name dropping there were certain ladies of the workshop place okay, who okay now now who i know were chatting, who now were I chatting <laughs> about this thing really you do what else do you have at home yeah. blah, blah blah everything but then you were there seated at yes, the table yes i know and that there was a lot of interest in that conversation in, i that these things are and, coming back and, to me and now. this is the first time you kind of sort of like a light bulb lit and you were kind of went and it was so strange cuz you just i think <laughs> you you walked up and you sat next to me this is at pereran sans and you just went why do you have tattoos 
I asked you that question. You, you just went. Why do you have tattoos? So then or I did I just ask to see your tattoos? Did I? No, you see? you did that. Yeah. Then you asked why do you have tattoos, and then you asked, what do they mean? Okay, that sounds like do, me. Do each of go the tattoos go deep? Go deep. Do, do they <laughs> yeah. do they have meaning? And then I started to talk and tell you what each of them mean, and then I could see a change of, like expression, yeah. not necessarily in a bad way or a good way, but it sort of dawned on you. We are like. Okay, so this is not some bloody it's, malevolent it's jackass. It's not just about the sex, drugs, and rock, rock and roll. Yeah, so yeah. there's actual thought, layers of thought that's gone <laughs> into like each tattoo, yeah. why it's why it's there, what it means, how it, the story that connects to the other tattoos, etc. So that was the first time we spoke. So okay. fast forward, I'll also tell you this: this this was an incredible experience for me. The time that we had on top of the rehearsals, I remember myself and. CC we were the guys from the rock and roll scene yeah. we lacked the theater experience yeah. we just done a bit of theater yeah. in school right and then you had the other jesus and judas which was like they Full had the theater, theater experience yeah. rehan and block and then i started to have rehearsals at my place at the time at mm. home with all the dogs and there weren't too many cats at that time but i did have bandmates and friends eternally yeah. over do you remember this where you guys were kind enough and benevolent enough to visit every evening where yeah in between bouts of intoxication we were like rehearsing the songs and here's the thing everybody else was intoxicated except me not you i, not you. I didn't drink re- let's make that known yes right? yes she no, did she did I not but i do remember that coming into your house and seeing so many dogs and then being introduced to michi yes right who is your number one insanity yes, over there yes yes uh, um I while everybody else was like drinking and having a good time and all that I was in your kitchen with the pets and pulling out ticks from Michi <laughs> Michi I think that would have been Marty Ah oh, no no yeah Michi didn't the like boy. being Marty. Yeah, yeah yeah and I I remember that that's like I bonded with your dogs a lot you bonded with and the dogs And anyone who has so many dogs and cares about his animals at that level can't be a bad guy at all Thank I you, think that's you. where I felt like I connect so, to Suresh. That that did happen. The passion he has for the pets. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank and, you. <laughs> and like while the production was going because it was such a long production, two weeks, it was going. And and the thing is, leading up to the two weeks, you have the like the light and dress rehearsals yeah. that happen at the vent. So like for the longest time, you're living in the liner vent, literally living in the vent. Literally. You're washing your clothes, you're hanging your clothes and there. And you're walking out of there at 8 o'clock in the morning. 8 o'clock in the morning, you're <laughs> back there again in the evening. Uh, but I remember the production went swell. It went, it was really fantastic. I remember we got standing ovations no, it for... Was, it was an awesome production. Other than the awesome first... Production. Uh, the opening night, for some reason, where two or three grouchy people did not get up. Every other yeah, night was yeah. a standing ovation. Yeah. Even uh, when we had the uh, the matinee, mm. and I remember I got sick. Not just me. There was a flu going around because it happens in such a large cast. And I remember CC got sick. I got sick. And I'll never forget how you sort of v- just ad hoc visited one afternoon and you brought soup. <laughs> Do you remember this? Yeah. Yeah, that that absolutely moved me. That was mind blowing. So, like, it, at the same time, you had a reputation that preceded you. Also, I still as, do. As this, not that one. And you th- <laughs> you have a reputation that sort of transcends the reputation. And <laughs> Several reputations a, for all my multiple personalities. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So it it's something that's like ever evolving. So like. even i was aware like to be very honest with you like we knew in school we knew of like and i don't mean this in a bad way mm. the iconic shanuki akki we 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 oh all God. we we all <laughs> knew make me feel old at all right for, now from like from theater we, we knew that yeah. like from shakespeare and like all of that stuff and then i i had heard of you from i mean advertising circles and stuff like that right that you were involved with like branding and communications and PR and all of that. I mean, there was a name to the face face to the name but didn't really know the character. Yeah. So the first few times also I bumped into you my, my perception was no bitch. No bitch. no no. Can look, I say that? No. Can I say that on no, look at it. It, it. it wasn't like that. But look at it uh now this is my perspective, right? Yeah. Now I'm thinking Karen. I'm I'm thinking <laughs> okay. 
going to be with a real bunch of straight lace up tight bloody theater buggers who, yeah who are going to like totally judge us for the way we look buggers who won't even have haven't even had a shot of beer in their life judgmental the high tea sipping <laughs> judgmental exactly right and that whole thing also you guys completely obliterated it i don't think i have really bonded with anyone the way i have and i can say this i've done some other theater productions also and i'm not throwing shade at anyone with the cast yeah you 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 sort of bond with the cast and maybe We but i mean family, everyone I that cast is really good from together. like the people yeah. involved in the production and directing to like it wasn't where just a couple of actors got together actors and actresses sort of connected where like okay we have our little cool yeah. kids but it it was not like that everyone sort of looked out for each other and yeah. it was the most beautiful thing for a while and i like to think that that bond is something that i think it has lasted with many of us i mean yeah. we still keep in touch but i i also understand it's very different because like i said you guys have done so many productions after so for me that was like a benchmark milestone a uh, lead role come mm-hmm. true like when you grow up as a kid who's like into rock and roll like you see Jesus Christ superstar and of course like but that is the iconic rock and roll the epitome it's a pen ultimate play, the right? apex of like nobody remembers Jesus it's always Jesus yeah Jesus Jesus Jesus, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> which is you know from Jesus Christ superstar <laughs> Jesus Oh god so that's it interesting uh, slip Not of the bad. tag <laughs> <laughs> So like uh yeah because I mean the singing and the acting and like it's got yeah. it's got everything it's intense it's 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 melancholic but it's beautiful it's uh it's all those things that like for us in stigmata from the get go that we wanted to encapsulate in the music of what we do yeah. though though stylistically we are a little bit more i'd say abrasive at times right but that was the for us it was like the starting point like we heard like jesus christ superstar and like we were like wow like we could ever do this so for me like vocally speaking like get so many was like that song if you have the range you have to be able to sing but like you said the part of judas he had the coolest songs and he had and I the think he story arc the most amount of energy to get through that show yeah, for sure but he had like some tough and, like, stuff and fun stuff emotional and emotional yeah it was properly an emotional roller coaster traumatic arcs that you have to take yeah. i think that that i think that production had traumatic arcs i think that production informed some of our lives after that that had traumatic <laughs> arcs yeah. uh for the longest time <laughs> ha ha <laughs> but uh yeah so i think we we were able to sort of really all those misconstrued notions that we had and that's interesting because we're talking about completely to uh extremes of the spectrum yeah right so tell us about uh, because this is something that's very close and dear to my heart as well the pets how many do you have what are their names how oh do boy. you manage <clears throat> because you tend to travel around the world often for yeah. multiple projects yes um so multiple pets has always been something with me i've never ever in one day had just one pet right i've always been surrounded by different things um so yeah right now um so I, there are 12 cats um uh, there are five dogs three with me two with my parents next door um and at the moment that's that's the brood and that is nothing compared to what i have had so i've been in a household where there have been dogs cats ducks chickens hamsters a cow and they all get uh, along they used to get along okay. yeah like rabbits that that whole life the farm life in colombo and then uh, i have parents who had leopards and deer and monkey and mongoose and wild boars so 
What in Colombo? No, not in Colombo. They were in Dabul at the time. That would have been fun though, having so, a leopard in Colombo. So Kalambo. that's that's kind of the DNA, right? It's, that's where it comes from. Yeah, and there's never been a day in my life where there hasn't I've not been surrounded by animals, and I've been known to. I I had a pet rat. I had a snake. I had a, a crow, an injured crow. I've had squirrels. Also, whatever is injured. Suddenly, it discovers me. I don't say I discover it. It discovers me. They come into my life and then they end up taking up residence. So that right now, it's cats and dogs. Um, some of them don't know that they're cats or they're dogs. That happens. There's, there's a different Some of them think they're there. humans. Some, yeah. some cats think they're dogs. The dogs yeah. think they're cats. Yeah, it's like my very own little Aragale. <laughs> <laughs> the Faragale. <laughs> Faragale. Yeah. They've actually been a part of the Aragale as well, right? So that, like, there was a time where everybody was putting up like posts I, and I all that. I remember. And my dogs went viral because they put up like the, the birds, go right? to go home boards and stuff like that. And I don't know. Once the uh, anti anti terrorism act comes out, I might get arrested just for saying my dogs were a part of the Aragale. But yeah, they they actually helped push the movement. They did, they did. I remember yeah. seeing the stuff online. It properly went yeah, viral. Yeah, yeah. Properly went viral, and Even they the cat, I think. and they yeah the yeah cat and wanted then, the caputas. And no, and they looked very convinced in their roles also. Yeah, they're no no they're they, are, like they they're, advocated they're, they're the very, entire thing. They're very politically like informed. <laughs> <laughs> so like, funny you should mention crows. I re- recently saved a crow that was attacked by one of my cats called Shawn Michaels, as one names a cat. And uh, Philip was injured, but in shock. Okay. And he grabbed the crow and took the fellow inside, like an aisle downstairs okay. into like an area, and then all the other cats sort of swooped in to the kill. But something happened that no one expected. When you sort of when when animals attack a crow, and this is why, and I I found out about this later. So it's called a murder of crows. Yeah, yeah. So an entire murder of crows, and this was like a Stephen King uh, movie, or like a, a Alfred Hitchcock's Birds, because I went and saved the crow. I took the fellow up to the balcony, and even the dogs freaked out because mm. I took the fellow to the balcony, and the, its sky was just blotted in black. Yeah, they all come after you. They all come after. In my case, the crow Hitchcock. Uh, he was actually rescued by the dog. So oh, Hitchcock wow. had been attacked by other crows, had fallen into my garden with a broken wing and all okay. of that. And the dog actually brought it to me. <laughs> so this is what happens with me. So that's uh, that's interesting. When it comes to animals, yeah. Yeah, luckily those fellows didn't decide to... Uh... No, no, everybody got along. Hitchcock, unfortunately, I didn't have the ability to... He, he hopped around my house, but then he was... He needed more time and care at that point an attention that i could give so actually cc took hitchcock okay and cc was looking after him and then kumu uh, came into the scene and kumu took it uh, where where is hitchcock no, hitchcock died i was i was informed oh. that hitchcock died oh. unfortunately because he would never fly again and then at a point he was in a uh, like a, a cage, cage sort of kind situation. of thing and i don't think that Ayo, uh, yeah, but, but the fellow that I uh, saved uh, went away after a while like uh, I had to like sort of s- sort of yeah. pet the fellow and calm it down and everything you're not allowed to have crows though it's you're illegal not. Yeah, yeah. To, because you can to teach them crows. to steal no? yes, yes. I've, I've heard I about didn't this. but even yeah. monkeys because of this reason even monkeys and which is we had a monkey I had a pet monkey uh, actually my parents had a pet monkey an albino monkey named Milky oh. who had been uh, sort of rescued from one of the Ahikuntaka gypsies the fellow was tied up at okay. some kade or something and uh, my parents had rescued so Milky when I was very little Milky and I coexisted and Milky used to hate my guts because Milky was very jealous of the attention that there, my mother there. gave me yeah. so it would wait until my mother left the room and come and like pull my hair <laughs> or pinch me or Milky would steal my milk <laughs> pun but yeah, yeah so yeah um, I used to want to be a vet all my life that was kind of the ambition that never happened that that's so that is the one thing your career path that yeah if so that's you an want interesting story right so ever since i can remember if anyone wanted to know what are you going to be when you grow up it was going to be a vet it was going to be a vet there was there was no nothing else for it but then my a levels came around and at that same time 
I was uh, asked if I would perform in the inter-school Shakespeare drama competition, right? And uh, how old were you then? And like eighteen, seventeen, eighteen, seven. Yes, eighteen years old. It was the final year of the A levels, right? Mm. And uh, at school, mm. I was doing bioscience. I was in the bioscience stream because I wanted to do veterinary, obviously. Uh, and school had this policy of the science stream students don't do extracurricular activities because they have to study. And it's like final year it's and all that. Yeah, no, yeah, it's yeah, such yeah. a local but school thing. You know thing. how it works. Yeah. So I wanted to be on stage. Right? Mm. That, that whole thing, we were doing Romeo and Juliet and mm. I had been cast as Juliet and this was like, ah, and <laughs> I wanted the... I wanted to perform. But you've done Shakespeare before. Or this I'd was done the first, Shakespeare. No, no, no. I had done Shakespeare yeah. before. But this character of Juliet, it was something that I had been doing with my speech and drama uh, okay. stuff and all that for years and years. This like I had this role in the bag. So I needed to do this, right? Okay. And so I actually got out of the science stream, mm. <laughs> which like went through a lot of pain with my parents over that, where I went and spoke to the school and said, I don't want to do science anymore. And the principal, I remember, was like, like, you're literally just compromising on your education and your future for the Shakespeare competition. Mm. And it was just, yeah, yeah, because it was just something like I wanted to do Shakespeare. And if I couldn't do it while I was on, uh, while I was a science student, I was like, no, I don't want to do science anymore. I don't like it. And it was like, so... Did the Shakespeare, switch okay. to arts, and this is like six months before my A-levels, right? Switch to arts, didn't know what was going on there. Had to catch that up in you six did months. Lit GRC but we and... won Shakespeare, school okay. won, I got the best actress. So it was like this whole moment of validation. Which year was this? Uh, this is 98. Okay, right. So in 98, right. and we won it with St. Thomas's. Uh, they won boys, we won girls. And it was like this whole thing, right? What did we do that year? Um, you guys did, I think it was mi uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay. Uh, we know, right? Tempest, Tempest, Tempest. Tempest, Tempest right? Yes, we know, right? Tempest, yes. So, basically, that happened. Mm. Then it was like, ha, 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 Shakespeare trophy up there. And oh, like, oh, God, now what happens to my future, <laughs> right? Because I'm, I am no longer able to get into veterinary school because I am not doing any level science. What did you do for uh, arts? What was the subject? So I did econ and lit. Greek and Roman civilization and, and lit, English right? lit. So it so became, like, it yeah, was yeah. like super easy also. Stuff that, you know, I had been reading books since I was two. So this was, it was easier for me. To pick up because the Greek and Roman was also a passion of mine. And so it didn't feel like I was studying. But then the whole thing of my entire pathway, my life's journey just switched like overnight. Uh, interestingly, it was that performance of Juliet that got Jerome's attention. Okay. So it was soon after I left school wondering what the hell to do with my life. And then I was informed that every loser who doesn't know what to do with their lives goes into marketing. <laughs> because <laughs> that's where all the rebel ends up so I was like okay so I'll do CIM I'll do a marketing course or yeah. whatever it was just like finding my way Jerome actually reached out because I was I was the best actress all island best actress Shakespeare whatever whatever and he actually offered me the role of Nala in The Lion King that right, the workshop plays right, were producing yes, yes. so that was my first step into like amateur but public performance okay rest is history because that just led into this that that snowballed into yeah, whatever just snowballed i've been like able crazy. to do with performance arts and uh, then the marketing which i was doing because i had no idea what else to do with my life led mm. me to you did Nan you played nancy in oliver as well yeah. yeah yeah i remember like but for me what really struck gold was seeing you in a street car mm. that was mad that was intense that was in design. yeah, yeah. You were insane in that, <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> I was insane, no, a little bit, yeah, at that time. <laughs> I think we were doing Jesus Christ Superstar and Streetcar Named Desire around the same time. Lines. Around the same time. So we were rehearsing for both at rehearsing the same for time. Both. Yeah. I remember watching yeah. that and thinking, okay, that's that's. I had to, I, I had put on the southern drawl and like, oh ma, oh, yeah, oh yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really, really yeah. good. It was really good. Um, Thank you. So I I mean this because I mean you are a multidisciplinary sort of I have entity. A low boredom threshold. There's that's there's 
so many things to like question and like ask this you. This is because Suresh, I tell everybody this. Like everybody is like, how do you do this, 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 this? I'm like, a, I have a low boredom threshold. B, I have mental health issues, which means I spiral into severe depression and if you anxiety. Don't do something, if I'm not distracted, busy all the time. Okay. If I'm not yeah. busy, the busy is what keeps me away from dealing with my realities, right? So these two combined means I'm always trying to do something new, and I have no idea what I want to be when I grow up. That that's always been a thing. So it's like try anything once, whatever suits me, whatever suits, and I, I'm in a. I understand that I'm in a privileged place where I have the independence to do that. Like, right. I like to do this today, I'll do it today. So not a lot of people and not a lot of girls in Sri Lanka have that opportunity to just decide for themselves and, you know, try new things and not have to f go down these conventional norms of expectations that, that families have with you. So I've had that privilege and that's given me the ability to try different things. But... Also, yeah. you worked for it. It's I not. Have, no. It's not just been thrust into a rabbit hole where. For sure, because I'm passionate about everything that I get into. I'm doing everything by choice. That's the difference. I'm not doing something because I don't want to do it, or somebody else made me do it. I make choices for myself in certain areas of my life, right? Certain areas That's I have true. like no control over, but. So these choices may mean that whatever work I do, it's because I want to do it. I love to do it. I enjoy doing it. And so then if you love something, you'll get good at it because you want to get good at it. You want to be your best at it. 100%. And I think that's what helps me. Uh, I don't know if I am good at it, but I do it to the best of my abilities because I really want to. No, but they're not. These are not disciplines that are far removed or segregated from each other, no? No. We're talking about uh, a lot of disciplines. Yes, true. We're talking about you've been multifaceted, but also they're sort of within, it's smart. You played it smart because it's within the same orbit also. Maybe. maybe I'm not saying you like, played it safe. Yeah, not but maybe, two different maybe things. it's also because I'm drawn to those disciplines, Correct. right? Correct. And I know, okay, I did theater. Theater is like a passion. Theater has made me good at certain things with the whole faking the charisma, confidence, presentation skills, all of that. So that helps And then you me. have the advertising experience as well. In, presentations, yeah, pitching, pitches. Presentations. Theater also means you're exposed to a lot of creative thinking. A lot and of working with a lot of different people. Diversity, right? You're know, creating visual spectacles, which helps with when you're writing, script writing, you know, creating film uh, ideas. The performance aspect of it then you use in your commercials, your character building, all of that. So advertising and creativity. Uh, they the, go hand in hand, right? Yeah, those theater and advertising went very well together. And then now that I am very immersed in cause-based work, mm. that helps immensely because I'm able to use theater and creative to create communications for causes I care about to try and influence people to work with communities to talk to them to train i do mentoring and training and stuff uh, and it's even if it's to do like street theaters or little videos online to sort of teach people about issues that i'm passionate about like gender-based violence issues or animal rights or whatever it is right whether it's cohesion social cohesion but yeah you're right it's i'm feeding off everything else that i've learned and i know and it's helped. No, for sure. I think you need to do workshops like not going and being a keynote speaker, other people's workshops. I think you No, need but to, I do workshops. Like I, your I like do. your own thing I'm thinking to like inspire I don't know, it's not my, young women. But I do. So I am sort of as a as a consultant, I do get sort of uh, signed up by corporates and NGOs and various groups to go and work with communities. So I work right. with women on things like sexual harassment and gender-based violence and work with men also on sort of informing them, you know, teaching people their rights, training the police. I've done that, you know. So there's, I work with kids when we talk, do things on mental health and uh, again, sexual, uh, sexual education Funnily enough, I've done like sex head workshops like me. No, I can totally see you doing that. No. With the dungeon and <laughs> no. the dragons and the, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> there's 
there's a lot of things that I had to learn before I could do those things. You realize after this interview, we've dropped like as keywords. Someone does a keyword search, yeah. the word dungeon and like yeah, dragon, so dungeons, many times. Dragons and no sex. For someone who just like sees the clips without context, yeah, you're probably gonna get a lot more DMs. Like after after probably. you, so Shanuki actually invited uh, yours truly and my wife on her. <laughs> awesome talk show if you haven't checked it out you guys should check it out it's called the Shh talk show probably yeah. the most controversial uh show i think in this country for good reason i mean it deals with a lot of topics and themes that need to be discussed and pardon my lingo i i don't mean this in a patriarchal sense but she's been the only one with the balls <laughs> <laughs> to do this here and uh, so we were on the show and it was yeah discussing it certain on on a specific lifestyle that you follow specific lifestyle that uh, a specific I follow lifestyle and, and then what happened dear viewer was that every person who watched that episode assumed that I was also into that lifestyle i was just merely the moderator of that conversation part my goodness didn't my tell, dm tell tell our dear up. tell our dear Do you viewers want to talk about it uh, tell our dear viewers some of the requests that you got from strangers Okay, so do you want to talk about what that show was about? Yeah, we can this talk about it. This is your about. podcast? That's fine. Okay, so yeah. no holds barred. No right? holds so, barred. So we were talking about kinks, sexual fetishes and kinks. And uh, because uh, this is something that Suresh is familiar with more than I am. but uh, So she says, folks, so she says. Yeah, I, I do say and it's kind of apparent. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we were talking about things like BDSM and that whole lifestyle and of course immediately people thought this is now shanuki is doing this episode because shanuki is into this and therefore shanuki started to this day this show was shot like what 3 years ago yeah 3 years ago. years ago so 3 years hence i'm still getting messages on my instagram and facebook about you know asking me if i can be uh, their dominatrix asking me if i can be a mistress asking me if i'm looking for slaves then can i be foot a rubs? slave they are offering for foot rubs yeah, complimentary they're, they're massages all sorts of things right foot rub would be at the bottom of that list then someone offered to do <laughs> shopping for you your grocery runs and no actually <laughs> what happened was there was a person who reached a complete stranger saying that uh, can i be your slave and for me with my limited understanding of that word i honestly thought he was asking for no paid work in my house okay so i was like you know this is not right people need to be paid for their labor <laughs> so you offered to pay for yeah. And I was like, no, you know, it's I'm not looking for a domestic <laughs> help. But even if I got one, and why is this man like sending me DMs in English asking me if he can, you know, do things for me? And then that is where that conversation kind of progressed into. That's not what I meant. <laughs> this is like when I asked if I can be your slave, and I'm like. Ah, no, ah, no, thank you, no. But you realize this was a can of worms that you entirely opened, right? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was all my doing. Yeah. But then, yeah, so I still get those messages. Now, they're less frequent because I I think, you know, <laughs> look, buddy, I am not into the kinky lifestyle. But here's Suresh's number. <laughs> Just, and they ask me if I can provide lessons as well. I think yeah, you've been. I get the. I get the. Where tutoring. can they meet people? You know, of this lifestyle. Where can I find? Uh, you know, BDSM practitioners, and I'm like, dude, I don't know. <laughs> Call Suresh. <laughs> I yeah, don't, don't know. Yeah, I'd I'd appreciate if you not pass my <laughs> contacts to these people as well. I I get the oddball <laughs> request also once in a way. Yeah. Right. So looking forward to you sort of like like we discussed before. So the talk show is happening. And talk show uh, is happening. The talk show has taken a little hiatus because Shanavi Diavis has been extremely busy or sometimes just not in the mood to sit and edit. So there's a lot of work that has not been done on my part. But yes, the talk show is happening and the episodes have become less frequent. Unfortunately, I need to push that more. Yeah, yeah, but looking forward to it. Thank it's you. going to be awesome. So we're down to what? The last five minutes? Ten minutes? Yeah, so tell me when we're down to the last five, we'll do the rapid fire. Right? But you just held the five now. Is it five? No, no. no. I, I, I <laughs> <have 10 minutes. laughs> yeah. We have ten minutes. We have ten minutes, yeah. So this is something I've wanted to ask you for some time. Mm. Have you 
not been interested in because I know listen you you sing amazingly you dance amazingly you act brilliantly not anymore as in acting well, yes <laughs> but the singing and dancing no but but little little difficult now like older fatter all of that no it's a fact i'm not saying exactly. it as a bad thing i'm just saying i can't do what i used to be able to do you ask me to lift a leg more than like say 25 degrees now it hurts <laughs> but do you have you worked on say your own original uh, script was was that something that was in the pipeline where you wanted to i did it in school i used to write scripts in school and direct them and I, i was pretty good at it but i don't know somehow the original scripts part came into my advertising work because i started right. off as a copywriter and you know the creative ads that i used to create so in a way it channeled itself into that i have done original songwriting i i did a little song during covid time i did this thing about sri lanka needing to get yes. along and stuff yeah where i sort of it was this animated music video called sri lanka machang it's on uh, youtube uh so i do little creative things like that as and when i feel like it i do uh, script write little not that i write but i create little original um i would say uh, like videos with kapila rasnayak we do this singhala based uh, videos to talk about certain social issues, issues. so like we character play and we do these things so in a way that's kind of where the originality goes mm. um but no i've never felt compelled to write a full play or produce something of my own it's, it's i've been too lazy to think about things like that like lazy or too busy actually maybe maybe but it's not something that i want to do that i'm happy to act the role that somebody else has written mm. yeah Yeah, Masan. So now you're not single anymore, no? No. Ah, who told you? So how's how's that going? That's going uh, well. It's a long distance relationship. Oh wow! So uh, the it could be better in that sense, but no. But it's it's wonderful because I've had. Let's put it this way: I have had a lot of learning in the past when it mm. comes to relationships. and in the process of those because there have been bad experiences good experiences but uh i've never i i went through relationships that taught me who i was and what my boundaries are mm. and those are things that i i would say there's nothing called failure it's always learning right yeah true so there were lots of lessons sometimes there were hard lessons to learn yeah and i'm glad that i'm in a relationship now at a stage of my life where, where i'm you can appreciate much it more. more confident of what works for me i'm not finding out and then i've been able to connect with somebody who's on an equal level of emotional intelligence which i thought was such an anomaly <laughs> especially in this part of the world uh because at a point you get frustrated when you when you come to an age like i'm when you're middle aged when you're a female in this part of the world when you're in this repressed restricted kind of attitude in society uh with men especially there are certain expectations that you you just get sick of it right like mm. you're only seen as one thing or mm. as a feminist you're constantly fighting against patriarchal norms that men have been brought up with and i'm so glad that i've met somebody who's just blown my mind in terms of being a bigger feminist than i am sometimes which is amazing somebody who's so supportive and on an equal i think i'd like to say the intellectual compatibility that 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 unicorn that you can sit and talk to for 6 hours without feeling the time going by mm. so in that sense it's a wonderful relationship it's very emotionally and intellect- intellectually fulfilling it's long distance so you know so it's a proper sapiosexual relationship where it was yeah yeah i would say it is yeah. it is why not it is and uh, so taking it a day at a time seeing where mm. it goes and that's nice because there's no pressure that we have on each other there are no expectations there are for a long time there were no labels we were just getting to know each other and just enjoying each other and the companionship the mm. companionship is incredible because he comes from the same line of thinking that you know he he's 
animal lover, mm. ardent animal lover, reads a man who reads Suresh. I know that there are very few of you yeah. around, right? Um, has the same tastes, has mm. the same sort of values. So it's it's nice. It's very good. No, it's man, a little but... lonely that he's in another part of the world, but other than that, yeah, for now it's good. You know, distance makes the heart, as they yeah. say. But no, no, I put up a meme recently, like this. this that it doesn't. It's all bullshit. The heart grow fonder is bullshit. Absence makes a bitch go crazy. <laughs> That's what the meme says. But no, yeah, he's he's very nice. No, but I I, I agree with you that uh, with the with the good or bad, like all our experiences, our experiences hone who we are, yeah. and I think it's the choices that we make. that end up defining us so like you i'm it's wonderful and i'm very happy for you and isn't it really good when you get into a relationship when you're a little more mature yes, yourself yes yes right and i think that's where a lot of relationships go wrong which i have also learned the hard way is when you're so in a hurry to do something that you you have these boxes you want to tick right correct and these expectations 100%. and you don't learn each other you don't know each other you don't you're not you haven't grown yourself Correct. to be able to Correct. contribute to somebody else's life right 101% because yeah. if you're still developing and your experience in self growth yeah. and you still don't know who and what you are you can't do yeah. it as one organism with another person that's impossible and i think it's nice i i mean people might laugh at the fact that oh middle age get into relationships oh, 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 but no they do they do for sure that's actually when you know better about what works for you Uh, they do six hundred and sixty six percent because yeah. even me one of the questions I get bombarded with is, oh my God how 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 is your wife how is the child you know you've just decided to have a kid now blah 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 and I'm like listen all the misconceptions and stories and taboo concepts that you have of having children being this and that and you know difficult and so I'm like you have to stay up all night you're like. I'm from an industry and yeah. a lifestyle where yeah. that's not an issue. <laughs> yeah. What about the pee and poo? Like, excuse me. We <laughs> we we we, we who I have guess. we who have <laughs> pets. That's 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 not even an oversight. Yeah. That these are not problems in life. But for us, it's a wonderful thing because we are at an age now where we don't have to put on hold the other aspects of our life that contributes to our trajectory of growth for this. Yeah. we are in a position now where we found more sort of a sustainable lifestyle we found stability and we can appreciate the moments more so i think for you kudos to you i'm extremely happy for you he has video calls with my cat yeah. if that doesn't like you know just just sign me up for whatever that is right? yeah but good for you man yeah. that's 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 good for you like really Thank you. very happy for you i'm happy at the moment let's put it that way i've i've learned enough to not have expectations or want things to go anywhere i'm happy with now as yeah. long as now is good i'm good whatever happens happens yeah like you know as they say stop it's a very stoic i'm very heavy into stoic philosophy so like yeah. you know they say stop counting your moments and instead make every moment count yeah We yeah. forget to live in the present. We are so engrossed we're with so, what hurt her. We're so impatient for a yeah. future that we don't know. Like we were, we keep yeah. thinking of a past that we cannot change. We worry about a future that we can't truly really impact, control, yeah. control that we forget to live in the present, Today. right? Yeah. So we're down to the last segment of the interview. This is the fun one. This is mm. going to be the rapid fire. Okay, let's so. go. Now when you put this pressure on me then the brain cells just stop working the neurons don't fire so then it's like zzz, <laughs> rapid is like I feel so competitive right now. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I know you are you <laughs> in in spirit you're competitive anyway in a good way. Yeah. So. Man I, I in a good way no, I'm a total <laughs> monica. <laughs> it's like absolutely. If 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 I I almost went to ask Belucci Who is Monica? No. Uh, Belucci. No, Keller. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> friends yes <laughs> okay <laughs> just clarify i never got on the friends wagon now by the way shockingly yeah okay so like i watched uh, sporadically so do you know how competitive she is like she no. she'll kill her own mother if she could if no, she no. Eat, so i i got i understood the reference yeah. because i have some sort of cultural ah, okay, good. affinity to this I'm stuff so but <laughs> we cannot be friends if you, you haven't, haven't watched, watched friends, friends. No. <laughs> so let's go with the rapid fire okay. right so we're about to 
Close the show with a series of rapid fire questions with Madam Dungeon, Mistress here. Will you stop calling me that? <laughs> <laughs> Madam Shanuki, the Alvis here. Thank you. What is your favorite book of all time? Oh my God, I don't have one. No, I you, cannot. Have you? I I collect I, books. I, know, I have a no, library. No, I can't no, tell you what my favorite book no, is. Can I? But let's just say that library burns down. You can pick say, only one book. Okay, it's called Act of God. It's by a, an investigative novelist called Graham Phillips, and he actually writes about he investigates and discovers the truth behind certain biblical events. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and it's really good. He's written a lot of other things as well, but Act of God is about the time of Moses. He explains how all, you know, those things that we read in the Bible that go, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, he explains how it could have actually happened from a scientific perspective. Nice. It's very good. Nice. Yeah. What's your favorite movie of all time? First Night with Sean Connery and Richard Gere. Richard Gere and, and Julia. Uh, Isabella. Julia uh, Orman? Julia Orman, isn't it? First night, yeah. Where, where, uh, Richard Gere is Lancelot. King Arthur. Richard Lancelot. is yeah, Lancelot. Yeah, yeah. So Sean that's, is that, that that simpering little girl in me who's like, ah. yeah. And Sean Connery. Movie, Sean Connery is one of my favorites. As Arthur. No, that was a great movie. Yeah, I Dude. love it. <laughs> Super movie. That was a good pick. What's your favorite food to eat? Oh, Suresh, I eat everything. Can you not <laughs> see? There's a okay. I like Singapore chili crab. I love pasta. One, one. One. I love sushi. One. I can't. <laughs> no, I can't choose one. I can't choose one because no, I'm female. So, so this will so make I'm it. I'm female. That my moods and needs that, and changes and loves change like the weather. Nah, it's not so fair to cook Favorite food to in. cook, favorite food to eat. Favorite food to cook would be Italian. Mm. I love cooking Italian food. And I'm a good cook. That's one thing that I know that I'm really I can good. attest to this, yes. Uh, and favorite food to eat, I would say, oh God, so difficult. You know, it's food. I'm female. Like, how can you? Um, I'll go for Singapore chili crab. It's for them female is like a sentence that we've uh, yeah, never heard before. <laughs> Come on, man. You can't ask a female to Sing choose when Sing it comes. Singapore huh? chili crab. Yes. I'll, for today. Yes. For today. <laughs> For today, that's For today. the favorite food. What's your favorite song of all time? Rise Up. Uh, Why? It's, now, this is the thing. I like songs. I don't Why? know who sings them, but I think her <laughs> name is on, Andrea. Andre, wait. Andrea? Andrea? No, no. I'll rise up. Rise like the day of rise up. Yeah, that one? Yeah, I'm like just like, I'm, I'm like just blank here. You just went Andra wrong. Day. Andra Day. Okay. It's called Andra Day. I'm going to have to check that out. I'll play it for you after we finish. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite theater production of all time? Hmm. Oh, the ones that I've been a part of? Or Both. Just ones what I've you've watched? been a part of and the ones that you've watched. So the ones that I've been a part of, my favorite, my favorite performance has been Oliver. In in Oliver, I think that was kind of something that I felt really good about my role. Mm. Uh, but other than that, Jesus Christ Superstar, actually, because that was the first time I wasn't playing a lead role. I was part of the ensemble, so that was my first ensemble experience, and it was the best thing ever. Really? Yeah, it was <laughs> the best thing ever because everybody else has to deal with the stress, and we just <laughs> have the fun. So yeah, um, the best product, the my favorite production that I watched is Book of Mormon, uh, which I watched on the West End. It's the most irreverent, the funniest, the the craziest uh, musical about these Mormon missionaries who go into Africa and try to like convert people into Christianity, and it's so wrong on so many levels. It will never be performed in Sri Lanka. <laughs> Ever. When did you go and watch it? Um, I actually went when I as a it was a fortieth birthday gift by an ex boyfriend to me because on my fortieth birthday I decided I created this little bucket list of forty I things remember. to do at forty. I was going to talk about that yeah. with the interview today, but so like I missed so these, many yeah, comments. I, yeah. I, I, like, I created a bucket list and I did forty things. You did all forty things. I did all forty. Wow, things. that's amazing. So one of them was I wanted to backpack around Europe, and yeah. uh, one of the countries that I went to was the UK, and my ex actually is a British and he was living there at the time. So as a 
40th birthday gift to me he took me to the west end and we watched uh, this uh, book of mormon which is just insanely i peed so much in my pants that <laughs> night just laughing my head off it's a really really good music yeah what is the one thing that you own in your life that you should throw away I think if you come into my house you'll see that 99% of what's in that house should have been thrown away. It doesn't have to be a materialistic a long thing. Time ago. It doesn't have to be a materialistic thing. What is the one thing that you have held on to? Oh, okay. That you can do without maybe if you okay. had the choice. Uh can be a material thing also. Very controversial is not going to make some people happy but I think I need to stop allowing myself to be emotionally guilted by my parents over everything that i do and say like mm. i think the the hold that parents have on you the parental gaslighting the gaslighting the emotional blackmail the, they are going to they, they are, don't they're, they're probably going to see this clip yeah yeah it. they will my mother is an ardent follower of everything i do and she's like but no i think that's the one thing is the the inability with all the boundaries that i'm able to set with everything else in my ecosystem this is who i am this is what i will tolerate this is what i will not tolerate i've never been able to do that with my parents so there there is a kind of a unspoken hold and i think that's something that a lot of sri lankans can uh relate to mm. but that's the one thing i can do without is not having to make a decision wondering what will my parents think Yeah, it's know? a very profound but it's, good good it's answer it's profound but i but i believe in one way it has and protected and a truism me. i think for a lot of yeah, people yeah in right? one way it has protected me from making mistakes that maybe you know i would have made and not been in the place i am today in another i think to a large extent it's held me back it's it's been a restriction and that's that's a mental thing i'll i'll say something a little deeper because there is this saying that you know an elephant mm. an elephant is a wild animal right and elephants are not meant for captivity we shouldn't but we do capture them and when you when you break the spirit of an elephant mm. right you can feed it you can love it you can treat it like the best thing on earth but an elephant needs is meant to be in the wild is meant to be in the wild uh, but we we capture them then mm. we chain them mm. you chain their legs right so if with any animal that you kind of tame or domesticate an animal you keep them on a leash you keep them on a chain or whatever mm. at some point you develop this human animal connection or relationship whether it's a good relationship or bad relationship there's a relationship then you take those chains off mm. but that animal has been conditioned to always to be believe shackled. that it is still under your control and i think in terms of parenting in this part of the world in the global south that's something that we do girls especially that there is a certain amount of psychological control and maybe parents don't do that i think a lot of boys have they, it also to yeah, be fair yeah but they they don't do it i i don't think a lot of parents do it consciously it's not like <laughs> we are going to oppress this child it's just a cultural thing that it's a thing of you know their their sense of protectionism comes out of what they call love or you know that helicopter parenting or whatever mm. so you are brought up to feel this sense of duty this re- responsibility and even this sense of subservience to those who raised you mm. and you have this constant obligation that you feel mm. they might have put it into you or they might have not but you're raised into feeling obligated mm. to make choices and do everything according to what would meet their approvals um so it's like that animal who even if they take off the chains you still feel duty bound to behave in certain ways to uh make certain choices that would make them happy and you do that out of love for your parents also mm. that sense of duty we call that love right that's what we call love as well so i think that holds people back a lot mm. women especially because we are in a society that also judges you if you do anything that is not Lenia. meeting the approvals of your family right yes the especially the um sort of the, the very conservative society that we are brought up in 
So I think to that extent, that is something that I could do without because there's a lot of things that I would have liked to explore that society may have frowned upon. But it would have been me trying to discover certain things about myself or try new things that wouldn't have been immediately shot down as, are you crazy? So I, I still have that like little voice in the back of my head, even though I have more freedoms now. Mm. There's still that thing of, you second guess everything you do. So I think that's mm. something that I can do without that I should have thrown away a long time ago, but I just didn't. I'm Sri Lankan. What can you do? I'm not re I'm not hating life at all. No, but that's a fantastic yeah. answer. But I think I would have done a lot of different things had I not felt that sense of obligation. Mm. <laughs> Final question. Yeah. What is the most fun thing you've ever done that you want to do? The most fun thing I've ever, ever done, done that I wanted to do. No, so past and future. Skydived. You have done that. I have. That was I, part I of your 40. Sky, yes, yeah, I went to Spain. I skydived uh, off in Seville in Spain, which was the highest skydive in the world. And the amazing thing is I love heights. And I was looking forward to this experience because everybody talks about the thrill, right? That adrenaline rush. I would have defecated myself and <laughs> No, died. but it's like this thing of, right? I was super excited and I was going alone, right? It's not like I, if I went splat on the ground, there wouldn't have been anybody who knew who I was <laughs> to even help at that point or even like organize a funeral, right? But it was this, this like, it was a sense of freedom. That sense of, I'm jumping off like 15,000 feet up in the air. Yeah. That sense of like, there's no one jumping with you either? Like no, a, no, no. It was tandem. A, it was tandem, yeah. obviously. I'm not going. <laughs> that's the first time I last time. I <laughs> but, um, yeah. But I went there with a lot of expectations. And the adrenaline rush was when I was planning that skydive. But when it was happening, it was like the most hmm, thing ever, right? It's like, seriously, I was waiting for the thrill to hit. Mm. And then, like, we're in the plane. And this guy that I'm strapped on to, he's like telling me now, no, okay, we're going to... And they had trained us like the, how to sort of make, keep our body and all that. And he's like, okay, now we're going to... And I'm waiting and waiting. And there was this other Indian lady also who was doing it with me at the time. And she couldn't stop screaming <laughs> from the time she got into the plane. She's just screaming, screaming, screaming. And I think she did that entire dive with her eyes closed. Now, I'm here waiting to feel this rush. And it was like... Huh. And then I was like floating about in the air. It was magical. Mm. It was wonderful. But I can't even remember that feeling any thrill. It was later when I watched the video of it because mm. they, they tape you. And then I'm like, oh, I skydived. How cool is that? That's like amazing. <laughs> but how come I didn't feel it then? And so that was a little bit thin, but it was the most fun, the most cool thing. And I've also ziplined across the Alps in Slovenia, okay, which is like... Also fun. That's the, those are those are two things that automatically propel you <laughs> to like a whole other plateau and level of badassery. No, I just so now I'm when you say that those junkie. are the things you've done, yeah. what what is left for you to do? Go to space. Nothing. So here's the thing, right? A lot of my like I said, uh I know we're running out of time. We've run out of time a long time ago, but a lot of the depression that I deal with comes from the fact that I've done everything that I'm happy to have done with my life. Right? Mm. I don't have I I don't know if there's anything left that for me to live for. That's that's something that I deal with every day, my my mortality or whatever it is, because we live because we have some sense of purpose, right? You're starting to sound like a death metal dude now. No, <laughs> but that's been me <laughs> as in I know, I've, I know, but I've visited you're... my favorite yeah. country in the world. I've done a lot of things that I'm proud of. Mm. I'm like, what's left? So I'm in this space of it on good days. It's the space of I'm really happy with my life. I'm right. really happy with myself. I'm content. Mm. I'm happy to just sit on my porch with the dogs and just watch the birds. I don't need anything more mm. in my life. I don't have a lot of material goals anyway or aspirations. I gave those things up a long time ago. I hit that age where that's not what life is about. I don't have anything that I am actively living for except that duty to be there for your loved ones, to take care of them and you don't want to put them in a bad place 
if you leave the earth right mm-hmm. you you don't want you don't want them to be alone you want to continue to take care of those you care about that would be the only thing that in that sense yeah. um so i'm really happy but on bad days it's about what do i have le- left to look forward to that can be there so those are things that constant um dance the yin yang between the yin and the yang yeah Yeah, but was awesome. that the question? Did I ask the question? It was. You did. You <laughs> did. My God. Thank you. So thank you so much, Shanuki, for joining me. Thank I you think for having me. I think we have a, I think a pretty riveting and uh, <laughs> obscure. You know too much. You know too much. No, you don't know anything. <laughs> It's going to be an awesome, awesome podcast episode. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the iFilm crew and team. And uh, I can't wait to see this. I think it's going to raise a lot of eyebrows and not just eyebrows. So Ew, Suresh. You you took that Ew. somewhere else. You took that somewhere What else. What the hell? I meant toes, fingers of and Of course, <laughs> fingers and toes because people just go <laughs> when they want something. Please. Of course Ew. they do. Of course they do. So you're watching the Island Renaissance podcast hosted by yours truly, Suresh De Silva. Make sure you like and follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram please hit that notification bell and subscribe to all the pages as well thank you